In 1928, the fledgling Nazi party is reeling from election disaster and struggling for legitimacy. Any observer worth his salt would have just written off the Nazi movement. But global events will throw them a lifeline. This is definitely an opportunity to access power, which even in their wildest dreams wouldn't, they wouldn't have seen possible. Propaganda man Joseph Goebbels devotes himself to tireless electioneering, while former war hero Hermann Goering gets a foothold in Parliament. And wannabe soldier and backroom bureaucrat Heinrich Himmler inducts a dangerous new ally into the inner circle. He builds loyalty by giving people who had a breakdown of their careers a second chance. In their fight for political and personal power, the key players will turn on each other and one of them will be destroyed. What takes place, of course, is one of the most sort of infamous acts of political violence ever known. This is the inside story of Hitler's henchmen, the jealousy, power struggles and fawning sycophants that will create a monster and fuel the most brutal horrors of the Third Reich. Federal elections present the Nazis with their first major assault on the German electorate. Combining Himmler's obsessive organization, Goering's wooing of the establishment, and Goebbels' relentless propaganda, the inner circle have high hopes for political success. But it's not to be. The 1928 election for the Nazi party was an unmitigated disaster, and the people didn't really buy into Hitler's policies. Any observer worth his salt would have just written off and indeed did write off the Nazi movement. Despite throwing everything into a professional, well-branded campaign, their message, one of economic doom, falls on deaf ears. In Germany, the good times roll. After years of financial crisis, the country is riding high on American loans. Things have never been better. In 1928, the German public felt comfortable and they did not need to be taken out of their comfort zone by Adolf Hitler. Fringe parties at either end of the political spectrum need a crisis to get into power. The inner circle needs a miracle. But then, America delivers this committed group the national calamity they have been predicting. October 29th, 1929 becomes known as Black Tuesday. The American stock exchange on Wall Street crashes. Germany had prospered briefly in the 1920s on American loans. It depended on an expanding world economy for German exports. Wall Street crash brought the international economy to a grinding halt. Overnight, millions of dollars worth of American loans are recalled. Germany and its economy go into free fall. The Wall Street crash and the Great Depression are an enormous disaster for Germany. Germany doesn't have the stability and structure that can weather this extraordinary crash. This is a major opportunity for the Nazis. After seeming irrelevant, they now look like profits. In this chaotic climate, it finally looks like the inner circle have a shot but real power. When the coalition government collapses, another national election is called for 1930. For two of the party's young guns, this is a chance to shine. Propagandist and public speaker Joseph Goebbels throws himself into the campaign. This is a massive opportunity for Goebbels, who's now the Nazi propaganda chief. You know, this is now a national stage he can, well, not strut across, but limp across, certainly. And backroom boy and meticulous planner Heinrich Himmler lends his organizational skills. They want to make themselves visible. They want to be everywhere. And top priority is 
is paid to making sure there's a representative in every village and every small town. Together they run a campaign that aims to give the party maximum exposure, a political blitzkrieg. Every beer hall, every inn, every tavern, every restaurant, every village hall, every town hall, you know, every little hut is going to have an art team meeting in it at some stage during its election. And they use innovative new ways to get their message to the masses. They will drive around in a van or in a car, they will use loudspeakers, they will distribute newspaper and pamphlets. But most of all, their sheer energy and passion is relentless. In the last four weeks of the campaign alone, there are 34,000 meetings called by the Nazi party. It shows, in this sort of pre-mass media age, the sheer energy that's going in to propagating the message. And this tactic will prove devastatingly effective. On September the 14th, 1930, the results come in. The vote for the Nazis is absolutely enormous. It's four times greater than it was just 24 months before. They now win 6.5 million votes, and it gives them 107 seats in the Reichstag, up from 12. I mean, th this is a political earthquake. For Goebbels, it's an unbelievable triumph. Goebbels was actually taken aback. He had hoped to do well in the elections, but not that well. This marks the moment when the Nazi party becomes a national force and clearly a force to be reckoned with. They're not in power yet, and there's still a long way to go. But they're on the map, and as the second biggest party in Parliament, people are taking notice. For the big players, the outcome of this election changes everything. The 1930 election is a turning point. You know, they can now suddenly begin to think about the possibility that they might even get to power one day, that they might actually have ministerial jobs, that they might have political responsibilities. For the first time in six years, their plan of achieving power through legitimate means looks like a real possibility. But for one member of the inner circle, ambitious former war hero Hermann Goering, the result means more than political gain. The election actually really sees uh, a fundamental restoration of Goering. He'd been in Parliament since 28, but he's got what is now a safe seat in Parliament, and also he's got the ability to start lining his pocket. He is an industrialist himself, he runs his own companies, and he's able to use the promise of what the Nazis might do to encourage support among the major figures in industry for Nazism. But in Hitler's inner circle, it never pays to take your eye off your rivals. The Nazi party is successfully moving forward. But despite political gains, there remains a lingering problem from their days of violence and revolution. The SA brown shirts, the street muscle of the party, is becoming a redundant embarrassment. The SA look like the rabble they actually are. Yes, they wear uniforms, but actually they're a bunch of thugs. They're causing a lot of trouble, and of course they feel emboldened because Nazism is now this huge political force. During the lead-up to the election, at times they'd abandoned their duties, and in some cases even attacked Nazi party offices. In the early 1930s, there's no doubt that the SA is a problem for, for Hitler. Sometimes they actually get involved in conflicts with party members. They urgently need a leader to get them under control. With his military background, Hermann Goering is the obvious choice. Goering was the commander of the SA before the putsch in 1923, and there is a sense, perhaps, that this is a job that he might actually take on. But Goering will be disappointed. Heinrich Himmler has other plans. He doesn't want to lead the SA himself, but he sees the threat they pose as an opportunity to shore up his own position. His well-drilled SS offer Hitler an inspiring alternative, one that Himmler has molded to fit the chivalric ideals of their mythical Aryan forefathers. Himmler wants the SS to be the embodiment 
of an ideal. He doesn't want it just to be a bunch of thugs. He wants it to be a highly disciplined, a highly politicised and, and highly elite force. But the SA, in direct competition with his SS, are a major obstacle to his plans. Whoever takes charge of the SA needs to be sympathetic to his vision, and he thinks he knows just the man. A long-forgotten member of the inner circle, Ernst Röhm. Five years ago, the World War I veteran and hardened street fighter had been a leading light in the SA, before a clash with Hitler over the militia's role saw him excluded from the party. Soon after, he moved to Bolivia. Throughout all those sort of years in almost self-imposed exile, there's been a Nazi who stayed in contact with Rome, and that is the ever thoughtful, ever cunning Heinrich Himmler. Himmler had been recruited into the Nazi movement by Rome, and now he sees him as a viable alternative to Goering. Working behind the scenes, Himmler smooths the rift between Hitler and his old friend Rome, and it works. In 1930, Hitler asked Rome to come back from Bolivia to take command. Hitler never entirely trusted Rome, but he recognized his skills were necessary to the movement. Rome is back. For Himmler, the arrival of Rome restores a relationship which he'd had before 1923. Himmler really thinks that there's a chance of collaborating with, with Rome. Maybe this will, will help to strengthen his position in the party, which at the moment is still quite weak. The move looks like a masterstroke. Rome will strengthen Himmler's position whilst undermining Goering. Hermann Goering desperately wanted to run the SA. So Goering essentially regards himself as being somewhat marginalised. It's another example of the shape of the inner circle shifting again. Rome's return is initially welcomed by propaganda man Joseph Goebbels. But things soon go sour. During the period after 1930, the relationship between Goebbels and Rome is not a particularly warm one. Goebbels didn't like really the military formality that Rome brings. Goebbels quite liked the fact that the SA was a pretty rowdy, but it did go out and beat up and kill communists. As Goebbels loses his influence on the SA, Goering sees a string of powerful jobs going to Rome. As Rome's rise erodes their power, it creates an unlikely alliance between the two rivals. Rome was being given a position that intruded upon the ambitions and advancement of those two individuals. Rome is dangerous to the interests of both men. Now back in the inner circle, Rome is making powerful enemies. But whilst the self-confident former street fighter has Hitler's favor, they must bide their time. Though former war hero Hermann Goering may be sidelined from military appointments, Hitler has need of his talents elsewhere. Goering was probably at his best, really, as a, as a socialite. You know, mixing with people, making contacts, you know, trying to find funds. Goering's a survivor, a wheeling, dealing man about town. But he'd be nothing without his beloved wife and society hostess, Karen. Karen is a very important figure, I think, trying to beef Goering up to become a political figure. They've been through everything together, but at a terrible cost to her health. Increasingly frail in October 1931, Karen dies. Goering is grief stricken, but the inner circle will use any opportunity to improve their standing. And Karen's death provides an unlikely opening for Goebbels. Throughout this period of turmoil, Goebbels, you know, the, the firebrand orator, is starting to settle down. He is a womanizer, Goebbels, a very unlikely womanizer if you look at him, but nevertheless he is. He has a lot of charm, and he eventually settles upon Magda. Goebbels and Magda were married in the snow with a guard of Hitler youth and Hitler as best man, and it was a, a, a very happy occasion. 
With Goering's wife gone, there's an opening for an ambitious hostess. There was always a great deal of competition between the Nazi elite about networking, about socialising and so on. And I think that Joseph and Magda Goebbels saw themselves after the death of Karen Goering as their successors. They both make the most of this opportunity to secure their place in the inner circle. The newly married Mr and Mrs Goebbels are the most charming Nazi couple. So when their beloved Hitler comes round for tea or a drink, there's, you know, Magda baking cakes. And Goebbels, meanwhile, in sort of an awful display of fawning sycophancy, you know, on the record player has some of Hitler's greatest hits playing in his speeches. But Goering will fight back. He soon overcomes his grief, and now with nothing to check his desire for money and power, he makes himself available to Hitler 24-7. We tend to think of Goering as this sort of fat, somewhat jovial figure in these big, silly uniforms. You know, he looks like something out of a fancy dress shop. And actually, that belies the fact that up there is a very calculating, very ruthless mind that will play the game. And now he's a widower, he can really dedicate his life to his own personal ambitions. Against this backdrop of constant electioneering and internal rivalry, one man is quietly moving up the ranks, Heinrich Himmler. Himmler, meanwhile, the quiet backroom boy, is busy scheming. He is very much building up his power base. Both the SS and the SA grow rapidly in numbers with the, uh, with the Great Depression. Um, unemployment brings a lot of men into the movement. And you start to see the SS become more and more of an internal police force. But although Himmler's SS is growing in strength, not everything is going the way he'd hoped. Himmler's plan to bring back Ernst Röhm is backfiring. The SA are becoming even more powerful and bully boy Röhm has no intention of following Himmler's lead. Himmler feels like the junior partner, feels like that Röhm's the big boy, the one with all the seniority. Realising his error, Himmler focuses on building up his own SS force. If he can expand their duties to cover party security, he will consolidate their role and strengthen his position. Himmler is beginning to think more seriously about setting up an intelligence uh, service within the SS, uh, one that is independent uh, from that of the SA and other party organisations. He needs an apparatus within his organisation, within the SS, that will spy not only on enemies of the party, but also can spy on people within the party under the pretext that they might be treacherous. And so he forms this thing called the Sicker Heitsdienst, the security service, the SD. Himmler needs someone to lead this new force, someone he can trust, a new member of the inner circle who will understand his vision and ambition without compromising his power base. In June 1931, Himmler meets a young man looking for a job. This interview will shape the destiny of millions. The man who comes knocking on Himmler's door for this job of running the SD is a uh, young man called Reinhard Heydrich. With his strong Aryan looks, he makes an immediate impression on Himmler. He's a vision of what he thinks the SS should embody. And Himmler, the wannabe soldier, is also impressed by Heydrich's military background. He's very impressed by the fact that Heydrich can uh, talk to him in military language and explain his plans for the creation of an SS intelligence service. The well-educated Heydrich had held a highly prized commission in Germany's diminished post-war navy. But then he became embroiled in a sordid affair. He was uh, simultaneously engaged to two women, and one of the women's father uh, was a, a very influential man with good contacts. But when the affair came out, Heydrich treated the father's complaints with contempt. 
an attitude that appalled the Navy. He kept one of his fiancés, but lost his commission. He wasn't considered to be a man of honour, so he was hoofed out. Now, he was engaged at the time, and so therefore, you know, we're looking at a man who is desperate. Now, keen to impress, the inventive Heydrich tells Himmler everything he wants to hear. All he has done is read, as a boy, some detective fiction and some spy novels, and he uses his knowledge of those thrillers to impress Himmler as to how an intelligence service would work. That is the limits of his experience. But it's enough. Heydrich learns on the job like no one else. The ambitious Himmler and his new right-hand man now control a security service authorised to spy on their own party members. It's a tool they'll exploit to the fullest. Whilst the inner circle jockey for position in the party, Germany is falling deeper into political and economic crisis, and Hitler continues to capitalise on the discontent. One of the things that Hitler managed to do in the period after the 1930 elections is to make the party appear more and more as a valid political party, as a respectable political movement. A series of elections brings steady political gains, and by 1932, the Nazis are technically the single largest party in Parliament. But a string of coalition governments and political alliances conspire to deny them power. By now, a massive 30% of Germany's workforce is unemployed. When yet more elections are called for November, the inner circle fear that if they don't seize this chance, they'll miss their moment. For a failed playwright and frustrated academic, the Nazis have been good to Joseph Goebbels. At just 35, he's in charge of a national election campaign. This is his biggest opportunity to date. Goebbels' approach is entirely innovative and brand new. You know, he is using all the theatrics at his disposal to present Hitler in a way that no political leader has ever been presented before. Goebbels devised a campaign device called Hitler over Germany, in which Hitler flew from town to town and city to city in a plane, uh, filmed, and the troops were on the ground waiting to see the Fuhrer descend from the skies, like some sort of avenging angel falling down from the clouds. And it made an enormous impact on people whose lives were grey and narrow. It's inspired. Joseph Goebbels makes Hitler look like a serious statesman, a real leader, a viable option. Hitler looks like a genuine 20th century politician, and the, his rivals look as though they're stuck in the last century. But despite their efforts, the elections don't hand them victory. Sharing 50% of the vote between them, the Nazis and communists are locked in political stalemate. If the inner circle are to tip the balance, they'll need the support of the establishment. But that's easier said than done. The German president, Phil Marshal Hindenburg, deeply distrusted Hitler. Couldn't understand mass politics, couldn't understand where Hitler was coming from. Hindenburg, the president, cannot believe that he has to do business with this former corporal. Only President Hindenburg can give Hitler what he wants, the chancellorship. Knowing this, a key member of the inner circle seizes a chance to improve his standing. Goering watches very closely what's going on late 32, early 33. He's president of the Reichstag, of course. He's in a good position to see what the possibilities are. Using his reputation and contacts, Goering's out to prove he's the only one that can deliver Hitler this springboard to power. Goering has a crowning moment in 1933. It's Goering who affects the meeting. He puts together these two men in a way that perhaps no other man could have done. Goering persuades Hindenburg to put his trust in Hitler. And so this facilitation, if you like, 
is a really key moment for Goering and sees him right back in the heart of the inner circle. Goering has saved the day. On January the 30th, 1933, President Hindenburg finally appoints Hitler Chancellor of Germany. For the inner circle, it's an incredible moment. Within 10 years, they've gone from street fighting terrorists to politicians, part of a ruling coalition. The day that Hitler was actually made Chancellor, the SA uh, stormtroopers marched through central Berlin and under the Brandenburg Gate, each carrying uh, torches. And this had a sort of um, visceral power over the masses. The celebrations, naturally orchestrated by Goebbels, are spectacular and give the world a taste of what's to come. But they're not there yet. Their leader may be chancellor, but the Nazis only hold a few cabinet posts in a tenuous coalition government. And beneath the veneer of a united Nazi party, the competition for those roles means inner circle rivalries intensify. Once Hitler becomes chancellor, there's growing competition between individuals who aspire to high political office. Uh, and some of them will end up without a job, whereas others will be propelled to a great political importance. Among those awaiting the trappings of success is campaign genius Goebbels. He expects to be given prestige and privilege, maybe even a ministerial job in the new cabinet. Whenever a new government comes to power, all the leading lights of the successful party are basically waiting next to their telephone, waiting for their leader to give them this plum job or that plum job. But although thanked for his incredible efforts, Goebbels' years of terror tactics and aggressive campaigning haven't made him popular in Berlin. Goebbels suddenly realises, as he waits by the phone, that it's not ringing. Hitler can't afford to be associated with anyone that might wreck his tenuous grasp on legitimate power. He realises that he hasn't got a job, that he's not one of the Nazis uh, who is uh, going to be appointed to the cabinet, and he was utterly cast into depression. But whilst one star fades, others shine bright. Goering's reward for securing Hitler the chancellorship is to be made Minister for the Interior of Germany's largest state, Prussia. Goering's elevation to be Minister of the Interior, Home Secretary, gives him a vast controlling voice in all the internal domestic affairs of Germany, in effect. Prussia is his, is his base, is his stronghold. Goering now focuses the resources of his vast new bureaucratic and administrative empire on achieving Nazi goals. It means that he can turn the Prussian police into a new type of police force, and a police force that the world really hasn't seen. Goering calls it the secret state police. Actually, we know that as the Gestapo. And the Gestapo, as we all know, becomes this absolutely terrifying embodiment of, of state terror. Initially, the Gestapo are tasked with political intelligence, but with their wider powers of arrest and imprisonment, in Prussia, under Goering, they soon tear up the rule of law. His role as the Minister of the Interior in Prussia is really used to impose the Nazi revolution on the whole area of northern Germany. His police now enforce the party's views, attacking communists and turning a blind eye to any aggressive Nazi activity. Going so attuned to that form of control, he's naturally aggressive in politics. And as Minister of the Interior, he has the means to put that aggression in, into genuine effect. Goering's seizure of Prussia through police control is enthusiastically approved by Hitler. But in others, it arouses serious resentment. There are two other members of the inner circle who look at Goering's success with really, really envious eyes. One of them, of course, is Goebbels, who just sees 
the success of anybody else <laughs> with, with huge jealousy, but his nose is really put out of joint. And the other man is Himmler. Himmler thinks of himself as, I am the security and police person. I am the person who gathers intelligence. I know about this stuff. Why the hell is this bloated former pilot now suddenly in charge of the Gestapo? No, no, this should be me. But even if Goering senses a growing enmity against him, he feels secure. He's got a couple of aces up his sleeve. He sets up his own research office, which begins to investigate other members of the party. He holds dossiers and files, which he's going to use at some future date. He shows a good deal of political cunning. What the Gestapo also has is a great head start for Goering because it's got all the Prussian police's files on Goering's fellow top Nazis. So this gives him a lot of power. Better still, within a few weeks of taking over Prussia, he acquires the holy grail of intelligence gathering. Phone tapping, which is a very modern device at the time, becomes a very important source of information for, for Goering, and he's able to surprise people at times by saying something to them they'd said on the phone. If Goering is attacked by the others, he'll be ready. Now the Nazis prepare to make their next move. They're still part of a tenuous coalition with just a few cabinet posts. This is not absolute power. Although the Nazis are in power, they really want to strengthen their grip. The inner circle decide they must raise their game. They argue the coalition is doomed to fail and call for yet another election. They now have just two months to secure a majority. Their plan? An all-out attack on their main political rivals, the communists. The threat or the imagined threat posed to Germany by the communists was a vital part of the Nazi narrative. And Goebbels lost no opportunity to capitalize upon this. Goebbels campaigns hard with his slogan, attack on Marxism. But they know propaganda alone won't be enough. At this stage, there's no doubt that what the movement needs is a crisis of some sort, something to do down the communists, who are, after all, the largest party still in the Reichstag. But however hard the Nazis try to provoke a major outrage, the communists refuse to oblige. In February 1933, Joseph and Magda Goebbels are entertaining Hitler and other party leaders at their apartment when they are delivered a miracle. The Reichstag is on fire. When the fire breaks out in February after he's taken power a month earlier, all the evidence circumstantially would be that it was started by the Nazis. This was denied at the time, and Hitler's reaction when Himmler and Goebbels told him of the fire suggests he didn't know about it. Nazi conspiracy or not, this is a situation that can be manipulated. A young Dutch communist is arrested at the scene of the fire. Hitler had always said that he was the force of providence. He was generally outraged by this attack by the communists, as he saw it, on the symbol of power, the Reichstag. Hitler seizes the moment. Within hours, he convinces Hindenburg to sign the Reichstag fire decree. Under the pretense of protecting the public, civil liberties are suspended, and the Nazis are effectively handed the legal authority to suppress any opposition. The Reichstag fire thus gave the Nazis precisely the ammunition they needed to argue that the communists were about to stage a national uprising. The Reichstag fire was the signal, the beacon that was lit for uh, the unleashing of uh, unrestrained Nazi violence across Germany. Röhm's SA, Göring's Gestapo and Himmler's SS all leap into action to brutally and systematically destroy all political opposition. You have the Prussian police descend upon Germany with pre-prepared arrest lists of leftist activists. 
At the same time, um, the SA and the SS are unbound. The SA, now enrolled as auxiliary police, are able to pretty much attack and kidnap their communist opponents, drag them off to torture cellars and submit them to uh, violence, terror and extortion. Marxism was effectively crushed at that moment. After all the Nazis' propaganda and scaremongering, this savage repression is generally welcomed by the German public and the party's popularity soars. Just two weeks later, at the elections of March 1933, the work of Goebbels and Goering pays off. The Nazis win almost 44% of the vote, still not a clear majority, but they are now the dominant force in the coalition. The Nazis are now in the driving seat. Once again, the inner circle await their rewards. Power-hungry Goering already holds numerous political positions, but now a new ministry is created with his talents in mind. He's tasked with secretly developing and building the world's first modern air force. This is the point at which Goering is no longer just a minister in Prussia. He's somebody with a, a national responsibility. It's a natural choice to set up an air ministry, and the air ministry is going to be a veiled way of rearming Germany in the air. Independent of the established army and navy, and with its own substantial budget and swanky uniform, Goering is in his element. Joseph Goebbels also finally gets the recognition he craves. It was the fulfillment of a lifetime's ambition for Goebbels to be made Minister of Propaganda in an entirely new ministry. He was very proud of the idea that he was the youngest man ever in Germany appointed to ministerial rank, and he was absolutely delighted with the opportunities that this new role offered. It is a role he relishes and rapidly expands. After a number of months, preparation, he brought all of Germany's artists, writers, musicians, painters and sculptors together in one organisation. Just ten years earlier, this young man was a bitter and frustrated journalist. Now he's at the helm of German cultural life. It's the first significant step on a road to absolute control of all media. This will become his empire and make him insanely powerful. With the Nazis in power, law and order must now reflect their vision and enforce their values. The nation's police forces must be centralized and brought under the control of one of the inner circle. It will be a prized and powerful position. Goering thinks that he's the natural person to do that. He's set up the Gestapo in Prussia. He's played a very important part in bringing the police over to the regime's side. But Goering has an unexpected rival for the role in rising security boss and meticulous bureaucrat Heinrich Himmler. The relationship between uh, Goering and Himmler in 1933-34 is a very uneven one. Goering is at the very top of the political hierarchy, whereas uh, Himmler is still kind of manoeuvring, trying to find his feet, trying to find his role. He's very busy uh, laying the foundation for uh, his subsequent uh, power. This is Himmler's big chance. He wants to be in charge of a unified police state run along the same lines of his established SS. He approaches Hitler to set out why he's the man for the job. He delivers. He's a, a can-do man. He's a very good organiser. Here's somebody who is clearly going to be able to deliver effectively um, a national police system. Himmler gets his way and is handed control of the nation's state police forces, except for one, Goering's Prussia. Goering retains his valuable Gestapo, and though he's lost out to Himmler for the bigger prize, he recognizes the young bureaucrat is a good man to get on side. He soon recruits him 
as his deputy in Prussia. He comes to the realization that Himmler can be quite useful, so they decide to work together. But of course, Goering is the more senior person within this partnership. Once again, uh, he's underestimating Himmler, his ambition, and his ability to build an organization. Goering has an ulterior motive for recruiting Himmler. He wants the combined force of his Gestapo and Himmler's SS and secret police to take down someone he sees as a major threat, Ernst Röhm and his SA. By early 1934, the size of the brown shirt movement has increased to three to four million. This starts to go, I think, to Röhm's head. Röhm starts to make speeches calling for um, the SA to become a people's army. There was a real bid for power from within the Nazi party, from the brown shirts, that with some justification had seen themselves as the battering ram that had opened the gates of power for the Nazis. The SA remained fixated on the idea of a second revolution. A military junta with them on top. Although Hitler and Röhm still appear close, they are ideologically poles apart. As Hitler starts to mature politically, and as he starts to grow away from you know, what is described as the drummer, you know, summoning men to arms on street corners, Rome starts to become more of an embarrassment for Hitler. Who is this sort of corpulent homosexual attached to him? Rome's homosexuality has never been a secret, but now as clean-cut legitimate leaders, it's becoming an exploitable issue for main rival Goering and his new recruit, Himmler. Himmler, once Röhm's closest inner circle ally, now finds himself in direct competition with him. There's a fascinating love-hate relationship between the SS and the SA, and indeed between Himmler and Röhm. By 1934, Himmler wants his noble SS order independent and not tainted by association with the crude thuggery and perceived depravity of the SA. Himmler finally decides his old comrade Röhm must be dealt with. Himmler, the leader of the SS, was a master bureaucrat, a brilliant behind-the-scenes manipulator, and he got together with Goering to organise a plot against Röhm. They both regard Röhm as, you know, acting against their wishes, and they also see an opportunity that if Röhm is brought down, then there's a potential land grab for both Himmler and Göring. They need to focus all their resources. So Himmler's sidekick, Reinhard Heydrich, is brought on board. Tasked with finding damning evidence, he puts his new SD on the case. They begin an intelligence surveillance program in which they try to find out what the SA is thinking and they bring all this material together, and they're going to feed it to Hitler. Despite targeting Röhm's homosexuality, Hitler isn't that receptive. As old colleagues, he's fully aware and has put it aside. But the plotters know which buttons to press. No secret is made when Göring and Himmler are trying to persuade Hitler to act that there is a, a decadent element in the SA. There's absolutely no doubt that Hitler is a homophobic. And the thought that Röhm and the SA leadership are all indulging in homosexual orgies is something he can't take. Hitler is told that Röhm's influence is not only corrupting the SA's hierarchy, but also the wider Nazi youth. A disgusted Hitler finally gives the conspirators the green light. Now it's open season on Röhm and his SA. Heydrich is ordered by Himmler to start finding out information about him. Confected information, but it's going to be enough. The Nazi way is make stuff up, throw it at the person, find them guilty, and this is what's going to happen to Rome. In June 1934, Hitler prepares a purge of the SA. He cancels their annual military exercises and orders them to go on leave. Dispersed across the country in small groups, they will be easier to manage. 
One of the strange things about the, uh, the purge of Rome, of course, is that it's Rome's naivety. He seems to have no sense, really, that, that, that he's perceived as a threat. And yet I think he really thinks that he's a help to Hitler you know, and that the SA, you know, will help to push the revolution on in a way that Hitler might want. In June 1934, Rome obviously isn't particularly alarmed by some rumours which were circulating that there was going to be some action against him, and he went down to Bad Vise, a lake in Bavaria, for a holiday. It will prove a fatal error. Goering, Himmler and Heydrich have been working around the clock to discredit Rome and have finally found their trump card. By the end of June 1934, amazingly, the evidence that Rome is a traitor has been found. And uh, there's this kind of uh, documentation that shows he's the recipient of millions of marks from the French government to try and overthrow Hitler on their behalf. Of course, it's completely manufactured evidence. Armed with their apparent proof that Rome is a traitor as well as degenerate, the plotters move to convince Hitler he must act fast. Rome's fate is sealed. What takes place, of course, is one of the most sort of infamous acts of political violence ever known. It's called the Night of the Long Knives, and boy, were those knives sharp. Faced with the falsified evidence in an extraordinary move, Hitler, the Chancellor of Germany, takes matters into his own hands. He drove in a convoy of cars with SS men, armed SS men uh, escorting him to the resort of Bad Wietze. At about 6.30 in the morning, Hitler charges into the hotel, brandishing a pistol. Makes his way to Rome's room. Opens the door and says, get up, you're under arrest for high treason. A sleep bedazzled and bewildered Rome doesn't understand what's going on, gets up. Hitler and his group also arrest other SA men who are actually in bed together. This is something that uh, the Nazis will use after the event to show that actually they were trying to get rid of the sort of moral turpitude, they call it, of the SA. It's regarded as this very sort of homosexual force. Proving their role as pure knights of the Nazi order, Himmler's SS round up 200 senior SA officers, wiping clean the decadence of the SA over the next 24 hours. Many are shocked. This is actually, in some ways, the opportunity for which uh, Himmler has prepared the organization for a very long time. They are demonstrating very clearly that they are the most loyal instrument of the Fuhrer. Others, including Röhm, are imprisoned. Out of a sentimental regard for Rome personally, Hitler wants to spare his life but he's persuaded otherwise by Goering and Himmler, who say, it's no good, mein Führer, if you kill all the underlings of Rome, if you spare the, the, the chief pig himself. After going this far, there can be no turning back. The following day, Hitler holds a tea party for his cabinet ministers and their families in the gardens of the Chancellery in Berlin. And while this tea party is going on, the, the playing out of the Night of the Long Knives is almost pure Godfather 2. It is like a gangster film. There are people being massacred, literally just butchered, shot, killed. But there's one death Goering and Himmler still crave. During the afternoon, they steadily work on Hitler. And finally, he relents. Hitler is still very reticent about having Röhm shot, so he sends word that Röhm should be made aware that he could take his life himself with a revolver. The SS guards give Röhm a pistol with one bullet in it. He's told, you know what to do. If we don't hear a shot in 10 minutes, we'll go and do it ourselves. It might be checkmate, but Rome's no traitor. Ten minutes passes. Not a sound. 
a fighter to the end, he's not going to give them the satisfaction. Two SS men open the door, and he says, you have to shoot me yourselves, or Adolf Hitler should shoot me. And so they shoot him three times in the chest and once in the head. Röhm's death is the bloody finale to Göring and Himmler's murderous purge. We still don't know how many died in that bloody long weekend of violence, but it was certainly in the hundreds. And it gave a notice, not only to Germany, but to the world, that you oppose the Nazis, the slightest whim, at the very peril of your own life. Within weeks, the mighty SA is nothing more than a ceremonial organization. And with Röhm gone, the major players of the inner circle have one less rival. After the Röhm purge, the entourage around Hitler all begin to develop their own power base, their own interest. The critical thing is that Hitler is at the center. You had to remain loyal. You couldn't be a Röhm because you would suffer the consequences. Two weeks later, the ailing President Hindenburg dies and Hitler merges the post of Chancellor and President, declaring himself the supreme leader of Germany, the Führer. The inner circle is now unstoppable.